I want to thank you for joining me today on this Tuesday, January the 12th. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful again for your presence with us and pray that you would inspire us as we look at the church year and how we think about Jesus Christ. May it be a blessing to us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, even though it's a Bible study, we will not look at any particular passage of Scripture. We are going to look at how we organize the church year to uh, convey a witness as to who Jesus Christ is. And so I hope this is meaningful to you because there is very much an intention every single Sunday of giving a witness to Jesus Christ and we organize it in a particular fashion. Now we're not unique in this. Obviously the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, the Episcopalian Church, Anglican churches, all organize their thought process around the church year. In fact, we share what's called the Revised Common Lectionary. Let me put that down for you just so you can see it. It's the Revised Common Lectionary. This is something that we have created together so that we can again express a faithful witness to who Jesus Christ is. And I'm going to explain to you why this is so important. But we organize around uh, this Revised Common Lectionary is in service to the church year. And what we do is we organize our church year into two cycles. Just two. And you know what those are? Christmas. and Easter. Those are our two cycles of the church year, and this Revised Common Lectionary is in service to this, so that we again give a faithful testimony to who Jesus Christ is. You know, this is one of the things I was actually listening just in passing briefly the other day to Joel Olstein, and he was preaching uh, on a passage of scripture, the turning of the, 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 the water into wine, and I just thought, oh my goodness, this man does not understand the Holy Scriptures. He doesn't understand how to read the Holy Scriptures. No, I'm not saying that as a blanket statement always about everything, but it was such an unfaithful understanding of this passage. He was using a, a technique called allegory. Origen, one of the early church fathers, often would use allegory to interpret every passage of the Holy Scripture. But this is not an allegory. This is a story that gives witness and testimony to who Jesus is, and he was touching, turning it and transforming it in a way that was not faithful to the Scripture. And this is one of the things that we believe as Lutherans it is really important that we use the scriptures faithfully to give witness to Jesus Christ. Not to twist it and turn it, to say whatever we want it to say, to be rah, 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 pat you on the back and, and oh, go live your life, power, positive thinking type of stuff. This is a witness to Jesus Christ, okay? And it's out of the witness to Jesus Christ that we are inspired. But he was taking the scripture and using it in really an unfaithful way that had nothing to do with the, as a witness to Jesus Christ. It was all about me and what God wanted to do with me. And that's not what that passage is about. So this is what we're trying to avoid with the church year and with the use of the lectionary to make sure that we are faithfully giving witness to Jesus Christ. Now, as I said to you, uh, the lectionary, let's start with the lectionary before we get into the two cycles of the church year. This thing that we call the lectionary is based upon three year cycle. We read the first year, year A, from primarily in the gospel lessons, the book of Matthew. And year B, guess what? Do you know what we're going to read from? Mark. That's right. Year C, we are going to read from Mm, Luke, wait a minute, we're missing a gospel lesson here. Shouldn't we have a fourth year? Well, here's the thing, Matthew, Mark, Luke are narrative type of approaches to, 
Jesus' life, and uh, they have a beginning and a middle and an end, and they're more like a story form, and they have all these parables and all of these things. Look, uh, John is such a radically different gospel compared to the other gospels, and it's a lot of theological treaties and teachings of Jesus, and so what we do with John is we intersperse all three years with the gospel of John, so you will not read John cover to cover, you'll read John interspersed throughout each one of these seasons. Now, we don't read just from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We also read an Old Testament lesson, an epistle lesson, and a psalm every single Sunday. Now, it gets better. Not only did that, but the lectionary covers every single day. There is actually an appointed lectionary reading for every single day of the year, 365 days a year. So if you follow the lectionary, you will read probably 80, 85% of the scripture in a three year period of time. If you follow the lectionary. And it's just a fantastic discipline. Now I know there are Bible studies where people will read the entire Bible in a year. That's a fantastic discipline. If you have the opportunity, you've never done that, I encourage you to do that. But this is kind of a, uh, a little more leisurely look at the scriptures. And over a three-year period of time, you will get the bulk of the scripture. And you will see who Jesus is and who this God is by following the discipline of the lectionary. And it will focus you around the church year and what Jesus Christ has come to do for us. Now, this is also an important discipline for another reason. And I, I, I'm going to point this out to you. I just mentioned about Joel Steen. And, you know, I, I've met Joel Steen. I, I don't dislike him, okay? Let me say it positively. I like him, and I get it, and I get what he's trying to do. Um, however, I do think that there are many preachers who do not use the Scripture faithfully in which the way it's intended. We have to interpret it the way God wants us to interpret it. We can't just interpret it according to what we want or what we want to get out of the Scripture. Now, with that in mind... Um, the great discipline about the three-year lectionary is that it forces pastors to consider a great deal more of Scripture than they would were they just to be on their own. Now, I know there are a lot of non-denominational churches, you know, Baptist churches or non-denominational churches or Assemblies of God. They'll, the pastors will say, well, I just preach on whatever the Holy Spirit guides me to preach. Well, there is a, there is a research group called Barnum that actually did research on pastors who preach on whatever the Holy Spirit teaches them or shows them what they should preach on, at the end of a 40, 45-year preaching career, they will only preach on 12 to 13% of the Bible. So what do they say? The Holy Spirit doesn't inspire them to, to, to preach on the other 85% of the Scripture? I mean, come on. It's not the Spirit that's guiding. It's just their bigotries and their biases guiding them. They will not consider preaching on scriptures that don't inspire them or they're just uncomfortable with. The great discipline about the lectionary is it forces me as a pastor to look at passages of scripture that I might be really uncomfortable looking at and forces me in a position where maybe I have to even preach on passages of scriptures. I'm not sure I really want to preach on. I can tell you for a fact, 20 Sundays a year, I look at the scripture and I'm like, oh, do I really have to preach on that? If I were just led by the Holy Spirit, I would run away from that scripture. But I believe that God speaks through 100% of the Bible. Okay? And I should, as a pastor, be able to look at that passage and say, what is God trying to teach us through this? So here's the great thing about the lectionary and the discipline of using a lectionary is that it forces us to consider passages of Scripture that we might not otherwise read. Now, the truth is, pastors who use the lectionary at the end of the same career still only preach on 25% of the Scripture, so we ignore 75% of the Scripture. Uh, because usually, lectionary preachers will usually only preach on the gospel accounts on an occasional epistle or Isaiah or whatever. But that's a, a much better, twice, twice the, the amount of scripture they'll preach on in their career than somebody who doesn't use the discipline 
of a lectionary. Now, if you've been in our church, you will know that I will oftentimes focus on the Gospels, and then some years I'll focus on the Epistles. Some years I'll just take a, a book, beginning to end, Book of Romans. I did that half a year it took me to preach on the Book of Romans. I had people ready to strangle me by the time we were done with that. But nevertheless, that's why I think the lectionary is important. Now, the lectionary is in service to the church year at this point and how it's structured. And I mentioned to you that there are two cycles, two larger cycles. Now, notice again my language. I want to be very specific about this. You have the Christmas cycle, and let's take a look at this first. The Christmas cycle, like the Easter cycle, is broken into three parts. The first season, so the Christmas cycle, there are three seasons in the Christmas cycle. The first season is Advent. Advent are, is the four the four Sundays. Now, it's the seasons of Advent. And I want to point that out. So every Sunday in the season of Advent is the season of Advent. It takes on the nature, the character, a season of hopefulness. That's why we use the color blue. Now, this is blue is kind of a new color, by the way, in the church year. <laughs> it, we used to have purple for Advent, and so it was more of a repentance type of season, kind of like Lent. But we realize that's just not faithful. We are anticipating something fantastic happening with the birth of Jesus. So in the, the, the Sundays of Advent, the season of hope, we look at the prophecies related to Jesus Christ. We look in the gospel narratives, uh, those stories in the gospel narratives that happened prior to the birth of Jesus. Elizabeth's story. You know, the Mary story of her being revealed by the angel. The Joseph story of him being revealed by the angel about what he was to do. Um, and so this is what the season of Advent is all about. The season of preparation. This begins our church year. Now I know most of us are used to the year beginning January 1st. But in the church, it begins with the very first Sunday of Advent. So again, this is part of the Christmas cycle. We get into the second part of Christmas cycle, and guess what? It's the Christmas season. So now we're officially the Christmas season, which lasts for 12 days, by the way. Not one. You know, I don't understand people. Christmas Day happens the 25th. By the 26th, 27th, they take the tree out and throw it out. I don't get that. Christmas doesn't begin until, sun, until Sunday, until December 25th, and we start a 12-day celebration of Jesus Christ. So all of the lessons in the season of Christmas, or of Christmas, again, I point this word out because that's going to be important later. It's a season of Christmas. All of these 12 days take on the nature and the character of Christmas Day. Every day is a Christmas celebration of these 12 days. And so we read lessons related to Jesus and his birth and him as a baby and what a blessing this is to the world. And uh, we uh, use white as the color of these types of celebrations. The white seasons, whenever you see a white color, like we have on the altar right now, is an indication that God is just giving you a precious gift. So every time you see the white color, Remember, God's gift to you. God is giving you something. What is God giving to, to me? It's not about what I do. It's not about the world. Nobody's pointing a finger at anybody. It's a pure season of just God's grace. What has God done for me? And so this is what we celebrate in Christmas, these 12 days. Christmas continues. The Christmas cycle continues with the third season called Epiphany. Oh, and we got the very first Epiphany is the coming of the wise men. Well, that is the Epiphany, okay? Because every Sunday after uh, Epiphany is called Sundays after 
the Epiphany. Okay? So again, Sundays of Advent, Sundays of Christmas, Epiphany, and then the Sundays after the Epiphany. So the main event of this season is the coming of the wise men. Now, I've told you, if you've been to church recently, you heard me talking to you about how many of our postcards have the shepherds and the wise men crowding out Jesus and Mary and, and Joseph and, and the manger on Christmas, that first Christmas day. The, the wise men didn't make it there at that point. It was probably six months a year, maybe even upwards of two years after Jesus was born that the wise men finally made it to visit with Jesus. And no, by this point, they were no longer in a manger. They were in a house. So obviously the Holy Family had every intention of staying. But it's the epiphany, the revelation that God has come for the entire world is witnessed through the coming of the wise men. And the three gifts that they came to bring of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So every Sunday after the epiphany is us wrestling with who this Jesus is. His nature, his character. The, very, the epiphany itself is white. The Sundays after Epiphany are green. So we're going to be, so when you see the green color, you're supposed to be challenged a little bit. You're going to be asked to grow a little bit in your relationship with God. We've seen the Epiphany of Jesus, the gift of grace, white. Now what are you going to do with who this Jesus is? The Sundays after the Epiphany. All of this is Christmas. So for those of you who keep your Christmas trees up until Fat T Tuesday, good on you! Right on! That's the way we're supposed to do it. Of course, my Christmas tree died. I couldn't keep it up until after. I kept it up until Epiphany, and then it died. I only kept it up a couple of days later. But I have some artificial trees that are still up. My Christmas trees are lit, and they're going to stay up until... You guessed it, Fat Tuesday, the day before Ash Wednesday. So this is the Christmas cycle. Uh, all of this again is Christmas. You want to sing Christmas songs. You want to sing Christmas things during this time. You can sing Christmas at all, all I care about, yeah, all season long as far as I, I'm concerned. Because that's the very first thing that gives witness to who Jesus is. How God has come and broken into our world to give himself for us in Jesus Christ. So that's the first cycle of the church year. The second cycle, what again is it? Oh, it's the Easter cycle. And you remember again, the Christmas cycle was broken into three seasons. Hmm, I wonder how many seasons there will be in the Easter cycle. Maybe three. What do you think? If that's what you're guessing, you'd be correct. Um, this is very intentional because, again, remember the number three is the, the, the sign of the unity, of the, the trinity, and the unity and the trinity and so forth. So I think there's a, there's a communication that's happening through that, through these different seasons. But let's take a look. The very first season within the Easter cycle is Lent. Um, now, Lent begins with Ash Wednesday, which is a reminder of our mortality, our frailty, our sin, our brokenness. Again, that's always on the Wednesday. Oh, I forgot, because the very last Epiphany, uh, Sunday after Epiphany, we celebrate as the transfiguration of our Lord. So every Sunday, and again, that just kind of pulls together the nature and the character of who Jesus is. We see a revelation of Jesus' glory and who he truly is, and then... With that in mind, we had to Lent, uh, Ash Wednesday, a reminder of our mortality that we're not worthy of this gift of grace that God has brought to us in Jesus Christ. And so Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the season of Lent, is a reminder of our mortality, our frailty, our sin, our brokenness. Now there are five Sundays in Lent. Now remember, Sunday's of Christmas, Sundays of Advent, Sunday after Epiphany, Sundays in Lent. That word is really important. The Sunday never takes on the nature and character of this season. 
The season of Lent is a season of repentance. And sorrow. Sundays are never a day of sorrow and repentance. Sundays are always a day of celebration, a mini celebration of the resurrection of our Lord. Because we do, even though we, we focus on the church here trying to communicate who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us, we live on this side of the resurrection. We know the hope we have in Jesus Christ. So we can't just put it in a bottle and pretend it doesn't happen. Every Sunday we gather together as a mini celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? That we live in that glory and that grace and how amazing it is. So a Sunday will never take on the nature and the character of the season of Lent. So that's why these are Sundays in Lent, not Sundays of Lent. Okay? That's important to notice the language. All right. So, the color, now I mentioned to you there's, there are five Sundays in Lent. There's actually more than that because there's, an, I'll get to that in a minute. But five that are listed as Sundays in Lent. Um, there is another Sunday that's in Lent, but it's another special day. That's called Passion Sunday or Palm Sunday. Now, you probably grew up, if you're like me and my age, you grew up with it being called Palm Sunday. It's the the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and everybody holding the palms, waving them, how you know, sing hallelujah and, and so forth, and it's just fantastic. Why it, it made a transition to Passion Sunday for a simple reason. Because so many people were not showing up in the 70s and, and 80s to our our midweek services during Holy Week. And so they said, well, these people have to hear the passion narrative. Because resurrection doesn't make any sense if we don't know the passion narrative and what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so it became traditional for us then to read the passion narrative on Palm Sunday. And so it's taken on a little bit. That's a recent innovation, by the way. Very recent. So as the church has become less and less an important part uh, or an integral part of people's uh, uh, daily lives, in particular midweek services. So we've got Sundays in Lent, five of them, and then the Palm Passion Sunday. Uh, the color is purple, um, except for the very first day of Lent, Ash Wednesday, which it's black. Ash Wednesday is the only day in the church year where you use the color black, a reminder of our mortality. Um, so we're in the season of Lent. We're using color purple. Purple represents repentance and represents uh, uh, our, you know, our, our acknowledgement that we desperately need God. And, um, and then, so we have these five Sundays in Lent, Palm Passion Sunday, for a total of 40 days. Oh, wait a minute. If you're smart and you start counting from Ash Wednesday to Easter, you will notice there's a whole lot more than 40 days. That's because, again, the Sundays in Lent are not of Lent. They are not counted in these 40 days. 40, of course, was representative of a long time of preparation. It's also representative of the time that Jesus Christ prepared for his ministry before he began preaching. So that's where that number 40 comes from. It's a nice little structure. But we are supposed to use the season of Lent to prepare our hearts to meet God in the resurrection again, that grace that God wants to give us, to acknowledge why this had to take place and how desperate we need him. But it should be also used as a time for generosity and giving of ourselves. So oftentimes people just give things up for Lent. Don't give something up for Lent. Take something on. Giving of gifts, additional discipline in your devotional readings, whatever it is. But Lent is an opportunity to test ourselves. So there we go. We got this, this Lent. Lent ends with the uh, three days. The day of days. We've got, you know, Maundy Thursday, which, by the way, means commandments. an old English word. It means commandment. Uh, um, you know, love one another as I have loved you. That's the commandment that we're talking about when Jesus washes the feet of the disciples and then is willing to give himself and then, of course, we have Good Friday, which seems like an oxymoron. Jesus died. Well, you know what? That's a good day. Jesus died so that we might be set free. So what seems like a tragedy, Satan thinks it's a tragedy, 
<laughs> he's celebrating, right? But it's good for us. That was God's intention all along. Good Friday, and then of course we have Easter Saturday, or I should say um, uh, um, the vigil, the vigil of Easter. And uh, the vigil of Easter goes all the way through Saturday, and then the first celebration of Easter actually takes place at the end of Easter vigil. If you've ever done an Easter vigil on a Saturday night, it's a beautiful service. It's a three-hour service, but that last hour is dedicated to resurrection. And it is such a beautiful, powerful service. Remember, again, Jews believe that the new day begins at the sunset. So sunset, 6 o'clock, Saturday is actually Sunday. All right, I hope that makes some sense. I know I'm running through this quick. So we're still in the Easter cycle. We talked about Lent. We get into Easter. Oh, my. Easter is a week of weeks. It's 49 days. Seven is the number of perfection, okay? Seven times seven is perfection multiplied by perfection, right? Okay, uh, Easter, 49 days, got to get my R there, is a week of weeks. So we have seven Sundays of Easter. So our gospel lessons all focus on Resurrection stories, witnesses of the resurrection during this season, all the different stories of, of that resurrection. You see a lot of John being used here uh, to supplement some of the gospel lessons uh, during the regular uh, cycle of readings and so forth. So these are Sundays of Easter. It means that it takes on the nature and the character of this resurrection. We celebrate Easter every Sunday. The very first Sunday of Easter, we usually have gold the royal color on the altar, and then again, white. White again, season of God's, uh, sign of God's grace. And so, um, now between the 6th and the 7th Sunday is the Ascension, where Jesus ascends to heaven. He says that was necessary because his ascension it signifies that it is time for the church to receive a special gift. That, hang on to your hats, because that leads us into the last season of the church year. No, we got to do it this way. Pentecost. Well, you know what? Maybe I should do this. This is very intentional here. Notice they got red and green. Red represents the Holy Spirit. Something magnificent coming. So on the 50th day, Penta is 5, cost 10. 5 times 10 is 50. 50 days after the resurrection... Jesus Christ gifted to us the Holy Spirit. So on this day, the day of Pentecost, the 50th day, we celebrate the gift that creates the church. We are the church because of the gift of the Spirit. Now the Spirit, by the way, was not given to you. The church, it was given to the church. And all of us individually, true, but it's meant to be used in service to God's church in blessing the world. We now become God's hands and God's feet because we have now received the Holy Spirit and can take Jesus Christ out to this world. And so every Sunday after Pentecost, we use this word after. Because again, the motivating factor for every Sunday after that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now what we are supposed to do is figure out what are we going to do with that Holy Spirit? How is it going to change our lives? How are we going to respond to other people? And you'll notice that our lessons all deal with wonderful stories about how the church interacted and blessed people um, with the gift that they have received. And so this is why it's not called Seasons of Pentecost or Seasons in Pentecost. It's season, it, these are Sundays 
after the Pentecost, after the motivating event that inspires this entire season. So for the very first Sunday of Pentecost, it's red, gift of the Holy Spirit. Anytime you see red, it's about what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of your heart, that fire from God. We only have a couple of Sundays or days where we use red. Uh, one of them is Reformation Sunday. That's near in October, usually the last Sunday in October. It's actually October 31st every year, but we often will celebrate it on whatever Sunday is closest in October uh, to October 31st. So the, we don't use red very often, but when you do, notice that it's always about the Holy Spirit. But then every Sunday after that, the Pentecost is green. Green is what again? A growing season. What is God going to do in your life because of the gift of the Holy Spirit in your heart? That's what the purpose of this is. Now, this season ends with Christ the King Sunday. That kind of summarizes the entire church year, Christ the King. Uh, so we see, we've seen Christ through all of these six seasons, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, um, and then we get into that second cycle, uh, Lent, Easter, Pentecost. We we conclude that celebration with Christ the King Sunday. It's a white Sunday. It's the very last Sunday of the church year. It's usually around Thanksgiving, maybe the Sunday just before, just after, depending on how how uh, the, the, the seasons work. Okay, just depends on when Christmas is. It's all based around Christmas at that point, um, depending on what the four Sundays are before Christmas. So we celebrate and end the celebration of Pentecost with Christ the King celebration, and then we begin a brand new year. So I hope this has been a help to you. I try to make references to this when we preach on Sunday because it's important for you to understand why we discipline ourselves in the seasons of the church year so that you can get a good witness to who this Jesus is, a good handle on it. I think if I were just preaching on whatever I wanted to preach on, you would never get a good handle on who this Jesus Christ is. Or you get a wrong idea about that. I'm afraid that this is what happens in many non-denominational churches. They don't really have a good handle on who this Jesus is because they're not dedicated as students to the Holy Scriptures. The church year gives us a good, studious discipline on trying to figure out who this Jesus is theologically and on a broad swath of the Holy Scriptures so that you get a witness to who Jesus is and what he's come to do for you. Uh, I hope this has, again, been helpful to you, and I hope it's been a blessing. I'm just going to end with this. Um... My hope for you is that as here we are in the seasons after, after, Sundays after Epiphany right now, that you use these seasons to discipline yourselves and grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for the discipline of the church year that reminds us of all it is that you have done, what is necessary for us to know in order to have a deeper, more abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. So we give you thanks for your mercy. And we thank you for those faithful Christians who've put this together for us and really thought and prayed through this in a way that we can therefore present to you, uh, present to our, our, the, the body of Christ, Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Well, now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have any questions about the church here, if there's something you don't understand, I encourage you to ask me. You're welcome to send me a message. You're welcome to give me a call. I'd love to interact with you about those things. Blessings to you. And may God be with you during this new year.